on May 29th, 1453, Constantinople, the renowned queen of cities, which had served as the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire for roughly 1,000 years, fell to the Ottoman Turks. For Greeks, the day symbolic is the beginning of over 400 years of Ottoman occupation. The day is also remembered in Turkey, where in recent years, its president Erdogan has revived the language and imagery of conquest, particularly evident when Hagia Sophia was reconverted into a mosque. Therefore, looking back at this day offers us not only a chance to revisit the past, but to learn from it as well. And I'm glad to be joined today by an expert on the subject, Andrew Novo, the author of the novel Queen of Cities, which provides a great narrative account of the fall of Constantinople. I've included Andrew's bio in our event description, but I'll list a few of his accomplishments here as well. Andrew holds a doctorate in history from the Oxford University. He is professor of strategic studies at the National Defense University's College of International Security Affairs, and he's a specialist in the history of the Mediterranean world, both ancient and modern. And Queen of Cities is his first novel. Um, Andrew, thanks for joining us to discuss Queen of Cities. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Andrew, Constantinople was by and far the city that surpassed all others throughout late antiquity and the Middle Ages, earning the nickname Queen of Cities, which is also the title of your book. How did the city feature in the imaginations of not only its inhabitants, but across the then known world? So Constantinople was, and in a lot of ways still is, a magical place. Uh, first and foremost, it was and is visually impressive. I mean, it's great real estate, right? It's where Europe touches Asia, across the Bosphorus. It has architectural and natural beauty to match anywhere in the world. Now, in late antiquity and in the medieval period, it was a center of power, faith, and opulence. So in terms of power, it's the center of Byzantium, which is one of the most powerful empires of the time. Uh, it's enormous in size. It's the largest city in the world at, at various uh, times in Byzantium. You know, in the 10th century, for example, it has about 800,000 inhabitants. It's the largest and wealthiest city in Europe. In terms of faith, it's the center of Orthodox Christianity. And of course, you have many monuments to faith there, Hagia Sophia, as you mentioned, being first and foremost, but a number of other great churches and holy monasteries. And of course, it's a center of wealth. Uh, part of Constantinople's geography uh, allows it to become a massive trading center between East and West. Um, it has fabulous displays of this wealth. One example would be the sort of golden throne of the Byzantine emperors, which is actually robotic. It's powered by water and air. There are two lions on either side of the emperor and through various mechanics, they can thump their tails. They can roar uh, to, for emphasis when the emperor says something and the throne itself can levitate. It can, it can rise off the ground. So for these reasons, it, it really gets uh, into the imagination of, of just about anyone who, who encounters it in one way or another. You open your book, Andrew, with a quote by a 12th century Islamic scholar who talks about Constantinople as a prize. What did Constantinople mean for the Ottomans and the Muslim world at the time? So precisely because it's a center of wealth, power, and faith, it Constantinople projected a magical hold on the imagination of many different cultures, not least Islam. And some of Islam's earliest successes were against Byzantium. Uh, in the seventh century, uh, the, the Arab armies were able to break the hold of Byzantium on the Levant. They conquered Egypt, the richest province of the Byzantine Empire. But Constantinople was always the greatest potential prize. In, in their view. And there are hadiths of the prophet promising the conquest of Constantinople. As early as the seventh century, Islamic armies laid siege to the city and attempted to capture it. Constantinople symbolizes the Turkish metaphor for world dom dominion, uh, which is called the red apple. And the conquest of Constantinople legitimated their, their quest to rule the world. Uh, and for especially Mehmed II to portray himself as a, as a second Alexander the Great. It appears, Andrew, that by 1453, the city was a mere shadow of its former glory with you know, barely enough men to defend it, as you clearly lay out in Queen of Cities. What was the state of the city and of the empire that Constantine Palologos, the last emperor of the Romans or the Byzantines, uh, ruled over on the, eve, on the eve of the siege? So 
Constantinople set the standard for many things. Unfortunately, one of them is a narrative of, of kind of a lengthy and inexorable decline. Now, th that's a long story, and, and maybe we can discuss it later on if you like. But by the 15th century, the Byzantine Empire was really just a handful of semi-autonomous territories in, in modern Greece, few islands uh, in, in the Aegean, and the city of Constantinople and, and its environs, really. Um, in many ways, the city was a relic of a remote imperial past, maintaining its, its existence through external influence, pressuring the, the Ottomans not to conquer it, or in some cases, preventing them from, from conquering it because of other geopolitical events, and by the impregnability of its defensive walls. The city itself, of course, had suffered uh, greatly in this period of, of Byzantine decline, um, beginning, of course, with the, with the sack of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade in 1204. So a lot of its riches had been stripped away. Huge areas of the city were uninhabited. There was pasture land where people had sort of started farming even within the walls. But in spite of all that, it still maintained this uh, magnificent image and it still maintained this hold on people's imagination. There's a scene, Andrew, early on in the book where you describe Sultan Mehmed as telling his troops that essentially they're now the inheritors of the Byzantines or the Romans ruling over their former empire. As you've laid out, this was uh, gradually what, what was left of the Byzantine Empire was just a few small territories in the city. Um, is this how the Ottomans viewed themselves as the inheritors of the Eastern Roman Empire? So certainly for Sultan Mehmed II, this was the case. Mehmed believed in, in the imperial destiny of the Ottomans, and in order to fulfill that destiny, the conquest of Constantinople was essential. Constantinople brought with it, of course, the prestige of the ancient empire, but it also had real geographical significance as that bridge between east and west as a base to dominate the eastern Mediterranean. Now, Sultan Mehmed also appreciated the fact that he and his predecessors were able to conquer a great deal of the land from the Adriatic to Mesopotamia that had once been the Byzantine Empire. So to occupy all of those lands and then to rule it from Constantinople would make him in a true sense the inheritor of Byzantium's legacy. On the eve of the siege, you lay out in the book uh, a few great scenes, and you show the intrigue that goes on both in the palace uh, in Constantinople and in the Sultan's court. And I want to focus on the Sultan's court for a second, because it seems like it wasn't everybody that was on board with attacking the city. Uh, what was it like on the eve of the siege? So I think it's an important point to remember the, the divisions within uh, the Sultan's court. And I, I think those stem from the realization that this campaign is an enormous undertaking with massive geopolitical implications. And so in the book, I kind of personify that uh, hesitancy in the person of Halil Pasha, who is the Sultan's grand vizier. And so from a cautious perspective, you have uh, a fear, a hesitancy that starting this war, uh, devoting so many of the resources of the Ottoman Empire toward the conquest of this city has enormous risks. It can uh, unite the, the West. It can unite Christendom against the Ottoman state. Um, it can expose the Ottoman Empire to defeat. Uh, and that, of course, would undermine its authority among all of its uh, Christian subjects. It could leave it vulnerable on its own eastern borders. If everyone goes west to attack Constantinople, it leaves it vulnerable on its eastern borders. And so I think those the, the intrigue comes from the realization that this is going to be a massive effort. This is going to be a massive investment uh, and that the stakes are very high. If the gamble succeeds, then Sultan Mehmed is going to really catapult himself into the upper echelon of, of world leaders and Ottoman sultans. He's going to be essentially untouchable because he will be the one who delivered the city for the Ottomans. On the other hand, if he fails very early in his reign, I mean, this he had a period where he had succeeded his father earlier when he was still kind of a child, but this is the beginning of his reign as an adult. 
if he fails at something so early in his reign, it would dramatically undermine his legitimacy and could potentially throw the empire open to, to civil war. So there's a lot at stake in this endeavor. What about when we look at uh, within the city's walls? You know, what are the big challenges and questions facing Emperor Paleologos? Well, I think there are there are a couple. Uh, first of all, you just have the practical challenges of how do you, as the emperor of a tiny city state, basically, uh, confront this massive army that is bearing down on? I mean, Constantine did as much as he could in terms of bringing people in the walls to safety, trying to bring in uh, grain and foodstuffs and war materials to try to sustain uh, resisting a siege. Um, sent out, of course, all sorts of diplomatic feelers to everyone uh, in the Christian world saying, please come help, uh, send us men, send us weapons, do whatever you can for us. So there's the practical side to it. There's also the, the intrigue side to it, which is that the Byzantine Empire at this time is a very divided, a very divided society, a very divided state. You have the promise of help from the West, but it's conditional. It's, it's very conditioned on the Orthodox uh, Christians accepting a great deal of new theology or from the Catholic Church and from the Pope in Rome. And so there are people in Constantinople who don't want to accept that, who would rather make a deal with the Ottoman Empire than with the Pope. And there's this tension of, well, we're here to defend our country how are we defending our country if we instead allow all sorts of people from, from the Latin West to come in and take it over? So there's a lot of court tension with that. And then, of course, you have the usual dose of uh, Byzantine infighting and potential civil wars of rival brothers and cousins who may want to depose the emperor and take over in this place. And, you know, in that in those tensions, you see that play out as you laid out in your book between, you know, the Greek Orthodox and the Catholics, particularly the Venetians and the Genoese, who have set up a very prominent presence in the city. Since we you know brought them up, what was the role of Venice and of Genoa at this time in Constantinople? So in many ways, this is the this is the height of the power of Venice and Genoa and the other sort of Italian maritime republics. Um, they dominated the trade of the Eastern Mediterranean during this time. They, they were bringing goods to Europe from India and even from China. This trade made them enormously wealthy, and they had trading colonies across uh, the Mediterranean to do it, and, a powerful, and powerful navies to protect that trade. So for them, they were positioned in Constantinople, um, above all other places, to sort of manage that, that network. Um, this prominence, I should, I should add, didn't really last long after the events in the book, um, because Venice and Genoa and the other Italian maritime republics were much smaller than the great land empires that were emerging at this time. Most prominently, we can look at the Habsburgs in Central Europe and the Ottomans uh, in, in the East. The rise of Turkish power fundamentally undermined the access of the Italian trading states to Asian markets, and as a result, significantly reduced their economic power. And most significantly, uh, around the time of the siege of Constantinople, uh, a boy named Christopher, uh, Cristoforo Colombo was born, possibly in Genoa, and of course, by opening the Americas to trade and European empire 40 years after the fall of Constantinople, Columbus created the final piece that would force Venice and Genoa into uh, an inexorable decline. There's one character bringing us back to the details of your book, Andrew, who is central uh, to the story as you laid it out. And it's the Genoese captain, Giustiniani. While everyone knows about the heroics of Emperor Valeologos, is this a character that we should all know more about? Well, I think so. Um, Giovanni Giustiniani captures two critical elements of the, of the story. And, and when I say the story, I mean both the story of the book and the story of the, the full Constantinople from a more historical perspective. The first is that he, he represents this sort of heroic age in, in many ways. I mean, in Europe, the 15th century is the age of the condottieri. And condottieri is literally contractors, which has a sort of strange equivalency in the modern world. But these guys are mercenaries who commanded armies 
for financial remuneration. They were soldiers of fortune. They could be brutal. Sometimes they turned on their, uh, their paymasters, but many also served faithfully and with distinction. And Justiniani falls into the second category. His role in the defense of the city was, was truly heroic and, and significant. The second aspect Justiniani represents is, is the powerful reality that in spite of the religious or cultural differences, the, the rivalries and, and infighting that we mentioned before, there were many Latin Western Christians willing to sacrifice their lives uh, to defend Constantinople. You interweave in your book uh, a love story for Justiniani, where he sails back and forth between Pera, which is across from Constantinople and a Genoese settlement. Uh, how did you come up with this? Was this part of you know primary documents that you had researched, or was this something that you thought uh, you wanted to add to the novel? So this is one of the fun things about writing historical fiction is that you you get to add certain elements and play with certain elements. There is no uh, historical evidence for the fact that Justiniani had uh, sort of a, a love interest in, in Para, but it's one of the very few additions that I made that that is something uh, creative to add to the book as opposed to something we can find in the primary sources, as you said. But the reason that I did it was to kind of round him out as a historical figure. Because as you said, we, we know a lot more about uh, Constantine Paleologos. We certainly know a lot more about Sultan Mehmet as, as people, as human beings, as individuals, uh, as to what, what motivated them and what, what made them uh, who they are. For Justiniani, we don't have that degree of detail. And so for me, adding this uh, fictitious, this creative element to his story helps us understand him as a human being more. You talked about these big personalities that we know a lot about, and you spend a decent amount of time highlighting the role of the Sultan, Sultan uh, Mehmed, obviously. Um, what can you tell us about him as a person? You know, what motivated him? What do we know about, uh, about this world leader? So Mehmed is a, is a fascinating character. Uh, and in a lot of ways, he's a, very, he's a very divisive character in terms of how he comes down to us in the recorded history. That's not surprising. Um, in the sense that the, the, the Greek sources and the pro-Greek sources tend to report him as with, with all of the, uh, let's say with all the terrible aspects of a famous ruler, you know, ambition and cruelty, uh, brutality, um, because he's the bad guy. Uh, Turkish accounts and pro-Turkish accounts, some of which are written by, by Greeks, by the way, who lived under the Ottoman Empire, are 180 degrees from that. And so in those accounts, he has all the positive aspects of a ruler. He has courage and he has genius and he has justice and he has great you know, ambition for, some, for, for, for the greater and finer things in life. I think what we can distill from those two accounts if we kind of try to reconcile them is that this was an extremely talented individual. This was an extremely ambitious individual, but this was also an individual who is, is, is driven by the need for glory, the pursuit of glory, the pursuit of conquest. And so he is going to shape his, his reign with that end. And, and we see that in his conquest of Constantinople, but then of course in his program to expand the Ottoman Empire beyond Constantinople. Um, I mentioned that Constantinople was considered the, the red apple, the sort of greatest of all prizes. And supposedly after the conquest of Constantinople, the, the soldiers started shouting to Rome, to Rome. And so it was this idea that it, it's not going to stop there. And certainly Mehmet's ambitions were such that he did attack uh, Southern Italy. He took the city of Otranto at one point uh, near the end of his life. And so this desire for glory, this desire for conquest really defined uh, who he was. What about Emperor Paleologos? You know, the same question, but about him. Yeah, so so Emperor Paleologos is a very different, a very different character. Um, I got the sense of this sort of man of, of 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 longing and of sorrow and of constant, you know, setbacks in life. Um, he wasn't necessarily supposed to be emperor. He succeeds his brother. Uh, he's married twice, widowed twice, no children, uh, no heir. Of course, very important 
for kings in that time to have a, a defined heir to avoid civil strife and potential civil war. And while Mehmed is in the frame of mind of, well, how great can I be? How much can I accomplish? I think Konstantin Paleologos is on the other side thinking, you know, how can I not lose? How can I avoid being the guy who loses Constantinople? And I think that that weighs on him enormously. And of course, his reign has many fundamental challenges, the challenge of money, the challenge of political and religious accommodation with the West, the challenge of keeping his own kind of crazy family uh, in order and not and not fighting each other even at the eleventh hour when everything is is very desperate, and so I think he shows enormous character and enormous strength of character and strength of will to to make the sacrifices necessary uh, to do everything he can to to try to keep it together, and you know he almost succeeded. And that's where I want to pick up with my next question, that almost, right? Yeah. Um, in your book, you write how everything is going to be decided on May 29th in a final assault, describing yeah. that while the defenders are desperate, the Sultan is also betting everything on this last attack. How difficult is the Sultan's position at this point? And so was there, an, if things had gone wrong on the 29th, could the city have been saved? So that's So that's a great question. And, you know, part of this... Part of this is the challenge of writing history in general, whether it's whether it's historical fiction like Queen of Cities, or whether it's you know a more narrative account or even sort of more contemporary approaches to history, is that because it's history, people who read it generally know the end of the story, right? I mean, you don't you you read a history of the Second World War, you know the Allies win, the Germans, the Japanese lose, life goes on, right? So one of the challenges that you have writing history is, well, how do you how do you make it interesting so that it's not a foregone conclusion? And I think in this case, the history helps because it was not a foregone conclusion. I don't have to, I didn't have to create, you know, sort of tension in this regard. It wasn't a foregone conclusion. And, and the reasons that I would say that, um, to, to respond directly to your question, you know, how difficult was the Sultan situation? It, it was very difficult. First of all, sieges can't go on indefinitely. Right, the logistics of keeping an army in the field in a fixed position against a fortified city for a prolonged period of time are enormous, particularly in the mid 15th century. Right, I mean everything from from weapons and supplies to just the the health of the army. Right, I mean it, taking bringing good stuff in and taking bad stuff out. If you understand what I what I mean, I mean for example, if Mehmed's army was about seventy thousand men and they had maybe twenty thousand animals, you know, horses, cows, things, the oxen to pull the pull the cannon, uh, sheep to eat, things like that, we're talking about two hundred and fifty to three hundred tons of grain per day to feed them. I mean, that's for a 15th century army, even for a modern army, that's a logistical challenge. How do you get that much food to people in the field? It's not sexy, but it's, it's, very, it's a very practical uh, and real challenge. You also have the domestic considerations, which you alluded to uh, in your earlier question, Thanos, about the divisions Within the within people saying to the Sultan, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure this is the best use of our resources? Isn't it dangerous for us to be here so long? Those voices are going to get louder the longer the siege goes on, and they're going to get louder the more failures you have in trying to take the city. And of course, the last piece of it is the geopolitical side. So dilatory as it was, aid from the Pope and Venice was on its way, and the arrival of a, a relief force could, could have uh, broken the siege. Uh, and then, of course, once that happens, it's, a, it's an entirely new ballgame. So as desperate as the situation was, I don't think it was a foregone conclusion that the city would have fallen in 1453. It's a bigger debate about whether, you know, could the city have survived? Would it have been, if it wasn't 1453, would it have been 1456? But, you know, that's, a, that's an entirely different counterfactual. Since we're on the topic of kind of, of, of what ifs, I want to bring in a question from our Q&A. Um, some of the most fascinating questions over history start with what if. And in the case of Constantinople, uh, can you comment on a couple of these? You know, one, what if the Ottomans never got their hands on the Hungarian canon? And two, yeah. what if the Byzantines had accepted the Catholic quote unquote deal? You know, would we have had a new age of two Romes? So uh two Romes. So let's start with the let's start with the canon. I mean, I think the 
if they hadn't had the, if they hadn't, the, so the context of that question is that there were a number of Hungarian engineers in, in the accounts who came to the court of Sultan Mehmet and had the bronze casting technology uh, to build enormous cannon, which were able to really batter the walls of Constantinople and were essential on a military level for the siege. Uh, that one, I think, is a, is a slightly easier what if, counterfactual, because that is just a question of time. Um, if they hadn't had the Hungarian engineers in 1453, they would have found other engineers the next year or the year after. At some point, they would have, they would have had the technology to bring down the walls. That, that was never going to, that was never going to change. Because after all, these are walls from the fifth century. Uh, walls are sort of, you know, slow to designed to resist artillery fire. They're vertical walls designed to pre prevent people from crawling over or shooting things over. Um, in terms of the two Romes, um, there you have a slightly different counterfactual. I mean, the first thing we should recognize is that the Byzantines actually do accept the Roman deal. Um, Constantine Paleologos accepts the Roman deal. They have a massive union in Constantinople. He accepts almost all of the findings of the, the Council of Florence from a decade earlier. And that's the parameters under which they operate. After the fall of Constantinople, the guys who succeed uh, uh, Constantine Paleologos repudiate the deal because there was a huge group of people uh, in Constantinople who had never accepted it. Um, and so, I think there what you see is the interwoven nature of religion and politics. There are people who are genuinely committed to oppose the deal on religious grounds, but it's very hard to disentangle where the genuine religious objection and the political, the desire for political autonomy uh, begins. So I think a lot of the division is cultural, a lot of the division is, is po politically motivated rather than simply a question of how you practice uh, the, the rights of the, of the church and the liturgy. I want to bring us back to one of the main characters of your book, uh, Giusignani. And a viewer is asked, you know, eventually, obviously, the city falls and the defenses can't hold back the Ottomans anymore. Yeah. What would have become if Giustiniani, who ended up getting injured while defending the walls, had not been injured and his men did not withdraw? It's it's possible that the um, th this is a big a big what if um, because as often happens, uh, it's not just a single point of failure. In this case, there are two uh, unfortunate things that happened for the defenders at a critical moment of the siege. One is the wounding of Justiniani, as our, our viewer has noted, and Justiniani is so seriously wounded. I mean, it's not his first wound either. I mean, this the one he gets that makes him withdraw is fatal. I mean, he's shot under the arm through his through his armor, um, and it's it's a fatal wound. But because he withdraws, he, no one is able to sort of have the gravitas in that sector of the line to hold everyone in place, and so people start filtering away. This is compounded by the fact that um, there was what was called a sally port, you know, a sort of small opening in the wall. And the sally port was left open and about a hundred Turks end up getting in and they end up getting massacred. But before they get massacred, they cut down the imperial banners and hoist their own banners. And so that compounds the fear that the city is in a hopeless situation. You have Justiniani withdrawing from the lines. You have the banners coming down. Everyone can see it along the line. And so you have this sort of one-two punch that really dazes and stuns the defenders uh, and allows the Turks to, to, to get into the walls. These kind of things happen. I think it highlights the fact that, you know, is the, um, is the fall of the city unavoidable? I don't think that it is unavoidable. I think these two events were significant. I think that if they hadn't happened, it's possible that the assault could have been repelled. But in the bigger picture, it highlights the fundamental vulnerability of the defenders, right? Part of any competition, if you will, whether it's a, a battle or a, a, an athletic game, um, is predicated on the fact that things are going to go wrong for your side 
And if you are the stronger side, if you're resilient, if you have the means to overcome those, that what that's what determines victory or defeat. I think essentially the Byzantines would have had to fight a perfect battle in order to repel the Ottomans. And, and these two uh, mistakes, these two things that went against them are kind of representative of the fact that they were against very long odds. And when those two things went against them, then the situation became hopeless. We've been focusing a lot on the men as protagonists in this story, but in your book, uh, there are a number of women who play key roles. Can you speak to the, can you speak to the role of women mentioned in your novel and their perspectives on the fall of Constantinople? You know, was it difficult to source their side of the story for the novel, or was it something that you took liberty with? Well, I mean, I think so. The the two main women characters are. Um, Emine Hanum, who is with uh, Sultan Mehmet, Sultan Mehmet's partner, and uh, Katerina, who is uh, Justiniani's partner. And so Katerina is a fictitious character, but her perspective allows us to gain insight into what other people who were not kind of at the top of the, the social hierarchy and in top of, you know, sort of commanding massive armies, how they were thinking of these uh, great events and, and how, they, how they would have dealt with them, how they would have grappled with these fundamental issues of you know, big questions of, well, what are you, what are you doing here? What do you, Justiniani, hope to, to gain from this? Uh, how, how, how is your life impacted by this? Should you be thinking about leaving? Because a lot of, there were several um, uh, Venetian and Genoese captains who were in Constantinople when the siege started who left. And they left for any number of, of personal reasons. So Katerina shines a light on some of those personal reasons. Um, in the case of, of Emine Hanum and, and her role for, um, for Sultan Mehmet, this is more of a historical figure. And we know that this character existed. We know a little bit of her background. Um, and it's a really good way, again, to kind of get behind the scenes with Mehmet in a way that doesn't have the same political stakes. So it's more of an honest appraisal of him. So when Mehmed is talking to a general or a vizier or Halil Pasha, the grand vizier with whom he has the rivalry that we discussed before, it's not going to be an honest conversation because both of them have their games and their double games and their agendas that they're playing with each other. With Emine and uh, Sultan Mehmed, it's a different dynamic. It's more honest. In some ways, it has its own games and its own double agendas, but it also has an honest component. And so I wanted to use those characters to bring out that, that honesty, that behind the scenes sort of texture that you don't get from the sort of grand actors with the grand motivations in the grand sweep of history. There's a moment towards the end of the book, Andrew, on the eve of the final attack on the city where the emperor is telling his secretary that this is likely the end and that nothing will remain of the empire after this. While he's right that the city would fall, you know, how has its legacy and the legacy of Byzantium persevered? So Byzantium's legacy is a rich one and one I believe which is a bit underappreciated in the West um, along with the history of Byzantium itself. It's not something that we, that we teach that much. Uh, it's not something that we engage with as much as we should. In practical terms, the fall of Constantinople uh, and, and even the decline of Byzantium more broadly was enormously impactful because it was a boost for the Renaissance. <laughs> I mean, in the West, there was an explosion of interest uh, in Greek and Roman history, in the Greek and Roman past, in Greek and Roman knowledge, as we know, and that's what we call the, the Renaissance. But while there were plenty of scholars who could read, translate, and engage with Latin, there were far fewer scholars of Greek and far fewer Greek texts themselves as a result. So during the twilight of Byzantium, and then even you know, exactly at the fall of Byzantium, there were numerous Greek scholars and philosophers who made their way to Italy. They played a major role in promoting classical Greek scholarship, Plato, Aristotle, philosophy, etc., as well as the Greek language itself at the court of, for example, the Medici in Florence or the Sforza in Milano. And this learning, this scholarship, uh, this philosophy, this engagement with the past was fundamental in the flowering of the, the high Renaissance in the late 15th century. You talk about Greek scholars heading west, and it raises a question that one of our 
listeners and viewers uh, sent in in the Q and A. You know, it's one that they say is debated. You know, to what extent did the Romans living in Constantinople at the time actually consider themselves Greek or even Hellenes, to use the word? So this is a great question. Um, Constantine Paleologos, you know, the, the, the coins and seals that we have of Constantine Paleologos, he styles himself king and emperor of the Romans. But he says that in Greek. So you immediately see the dichotomy, right? If you say king and emperor of the Romans, you would expect to write that in Latin. And of course, the whole idea of king, Vasilefs, right, in, in, in Greek, you would never use that term. No, no self-respecting Roman would ever use that term because the idea of king is antithetical to the idea of Rome. And if you're wondering about that, you can just ask Julius Caesar after he was stabbed 23 times for aspiring to be king. So there is fundamentally this, this dichotomy, this um, syncretic approach to the past, which is one of the things that Byzantium does a very good job of. I mean, Byzantium manages simultaneously to be the keepers of classical Greek knowledge, right? Everything from Thucydides to Plato, but at the same time, it's also an inherently Christian endeavor. And so they managed to create a syncretic approach between the pagan past and the Christian present for them. Um, they consider themselves the heirs of Rome, politically, geopolitically, um, in terms of empire, in terms of stature, and in terms of grandeur, but they also recognize themselves as, as culturally Greek, speaking Greek, and fundamentally different from the pagan past because they are fundamentally Christian. So it's a fascinating kind of synergy and a mix of these different elements. I wanna bring us, Andrew, to the present. Yeah. Uh, the language and imagery of conquest has made a comeback. And this, as I mentioned in the introduction, was particularly evident when President Erdogan reconverted Hagia Sophia into a mosque. What does 1453 mean in today's Turkey, particularly for Erdogan? And to pull in a question from one of our viewers, do you see any similarity between Erdogan's character and Sultan Mehmet? Or do you think that Erdogan sees similarities between himself and the Sultan? So, so since we're in the present, I, I should give the, the, the DOD disclaimer I'm supposed to give before all my talks, which is that I'm not sort of representing the views of the Department of Defense or the, the US government more broadly. Um, but, but I will say this, I mean, you, you can see this legacy playing out as we speak, right? Erdogan's campaign rallies have reenactors in 15th century period costumes playing out the conquest of Constantinople in front of giant campaign posters with Mehmet II and guns blazing at the smoldering walls of the city. For many Turks, Mehmet II is the conqueror. He is not only that, but you know, there was a modern historian who describes him as you know, the most brilliant and blameless figure in Turkish history. That, that's the Turkish view, right? The Turkish view is that he's the most brilliant and blameless figure in Turkish history. And the same author, who, by the way, is generally quite sympathetic uh, in his biography of Mehmet, writes that you can't explain that attitude without virulent nationalism. So uh, there is a Turkish film from 2012 called Conquest, Fetih, 1453, and it propagandizes this pristine image of Mehmet. You know, at the end of the movie, he he walks into the Hagia Sophia and all of the Byzantines are kind of cowering, afraid about what's gonna to happen to them. And he just walks in and smiles and says reassuring words to them and holds a baby who tugs his beard and he smiles and sort of tickles the child's cheek. That's complete fiction, right? I mean, we know that the Hagia Sophia was basically an, uh, a slave market on, on May 29th, uh, 1453. People were being killed, people were being abused, people were being sold into slavery, monuments were being destroyed. It wasn't anything like that. It's fantasy, right? It's nationalist propaganda parading his history. In contemporary Turkey, that view of Sultan Mehmet plays remarkably well. And Erdogan has been very successful in tapping into the appeal of Turkey's imperial past. Part of his campaign this year has been to portray himself as a ruler who's able to restore Turkey's greatness, right? Turkey's rightful place in the world. So for him, the imagery of Mehmet 
uh, the imagery of 1453 and the conquest of Constantinople are too valuable to ignore. It's something that he wants to sort of appropriate for himself and imitate. Looking at the overall legacy of 1453, Andrew, um, what did the fall of Constantinople mean for world history? Because we've had similar discussions in the past, and um, I'll point our listeners to a discussion we had with Roger Crowley uh, in one of our live sessions as well, where he had linked it to a 9-11 uh, at the time, where kind of everybody knew where they were when they heard the news. Just how impactful was the fall of Constantinople? Well, in, in the sense of everybody knowing where they were when they heard the news, it was enormously impactful. Um, and I think it was compounded by the fact that, you know, as, as much as the people who were involved directly knew how vulnerable Constantinople was, for most of the people in the rest of the world, especially in the West, they didn't know that. So for them, it was a surprise. It was how can this city, which, you know, has never fallen to the, to the Turks, has never fallen to Islam, fall? So there was, a, there was a moment of incredulity about it. I think in terms of geopolitical impact, we go back to the geography of it. Um, one of the reasons why the sultans wanted Constantinople so much was that it was right at the heart of their domains, right? They controlled territory in Asia, in Anatolia, in the Levant, uh, and they controlled territory in Europe, in the Balkans, in Hungary. And so Constantinople was right where those two realms met. And so having a hostile power at the center of your empire is not a good thing. And so they were always wary. How far west can we go if this exists here? Will there be an alliance against us in our own heartland? Once Constantinople falls, that fear is gone. And so what that does is it gives them the strategic flexibility to then embark on a great age of conquest. And so from 1453 until 1565, which I'll get to the significance of that date in a second, it is uninterrupted Ottoman expansion and nothing and no one is safe, so to speak, in the, in the Western world. Um, Hungary is defeated again and again, Albania, Serbia, um, Vienna is under attack in, the 15, in 1527, there's, there's the siege of Vienna. And so, the taking of Constantinople frees the Ottoman Empire to launch this period of unchecked, basically unchecked expansion. And that period comes to an end in some ways. You could, you could point to the date of 1565, which is the siege of, of Rhodes. Uh, sorry, the, sorry, the siege of Malta. The, the Knights of Rhodes are kicked out of Rhodes. They go to Malta. And in 1565 at Malta, the Ottoman armies again sort of meet an obstacle they can't overcome. And this kind of changes the dynamics for relations in the Mediterranean moving forward. So from that perspective, it's enormously impactful. Andrew, we have time for a couple of questions. One of our listeners has asked, you know, what, what inspired you most to write your book? Was it, you know, were there any books that stood out for you? Or was it a personal connection to the story uh, and to the region? Um, what essentially pulled you into write Queen of Cities? So. Uh, that, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I think for me, the inspiration was, um, was, was, was a few things. I, I did read a couple of shorter articles about the fall of Constantinople. There's a, there's a, um, there are a couple of famous books about it as well, but they go back much further than Roger Crowley's book. I mean, they go back to like the 1950s and 1960s uh, and scholars like uh, John Julius Norwich. Um, but for me, there was that the element of the drama of the event was remarkable and inspirational uh, because there are very few events in history that are so clear and clearly defined. You know, today it exists, tomorrow it didn't, right? So today, May 28th, there is a Byzantium and tomorrow, May 29th, there, there isn't a Byzantium anymore, right? And May 30th, it's gone. Um, that's why you know, a lot of historians write in one form or another, the Western Roman Empire went out with a, a whimper, the Eastern Roman Empire went out with a bang, right? People still debate when exactly did the Western Roman Empire fall? You know, it's, it's a squishy date. With the case of Byzantium, it's a hard date. And so there's an enormous amount of drama. You got to it a little bit, Thanos, with your question about um, the scene in the book with Constantine Paleologos before the final attack. There's an enormous amount of drama about grappling with a world that you see slipping away 
and that disappears before your eyes. Embedded in that drama is the humanity of it. I mean, these characters, the ones I didn't have to make up, like Sultan Mehmet, like Konstantin Paleologos, like uh, his secretary, uh, George Francis, like uh, Justiniani, they're real characters from history and they have an enormous, um, they had an enormous impact on me that I wanted to sort of tell their story and to get their uh, emotion captured in a, in a work like this. And the last motivation was something I alluded to before, which is that this is an enormously important event that a lot of people, I should say a lot of people outside the Greek and Greek American community just don't know about. It's not on their radar. And yet it was so important for the development of modern Europe. It was so important for the development of the Renaissance, for the progress of Western civilization. And yet it's not something that we engage with very much. If you were to give our listeners uh, a recommended reading list, if they wanted to study up on the fall of Constantinople, are there any that really stand out to you? Aside from Queen of Cities, which will include a link for uh, on Amazon and uh, where they can pick it up. Well, I mean, there's so there there are two kinds. So there are two kinds of uh, sources, of course, for for the, the fall of Constantinople, right? The, the secondary sources and the um, primary sources. So I think the for the secondary sources that people um, would encounter in their in their bookstore, there's um, John Julius Norwich's books about the end of Byzantium and um, Venice. There's Stephen Runciman's book, which was one that inspired me on the fall of Constantinople, and that goes back to the, to the 1950s. I think it was published in 1957. And of course, you mentioned Roger Crowley. Roger Crowley's book on the fall of Constantinople is excellent, as is his other work on, um, I, I really loved his book on the, the, the war for the, the Middle Sea with, uh, it's the story of Lepanto and, and uh, the Siege of Malta. That's, that's the, I think that was my, his favorite book of mine. Um, but there's also, in the case of the, the Siege of Constantinople, a lot of very interesting um, primary sources. Um, and the most prominent for that is the diary of the Siege of Constantinople by the Venetian Niccolo Barbaro. Um, there's also uh, Jacopo Tedaldi, who was a Florentine merchant. He wrote a, a diary of the Siege of Constantinople as well. Um, there's a letter from the Podesta of the Genovese uh, colony of Pera to the Pope talking about the end of the siege uh, and his sort of experience with the trying to survive afterwards. And all of these are very fascinating um, accounts of, of the siege. So they're all, they're all good things to read. Wrapping up, Andrew, is there anything new that you're working on that you can uh, tell our readers about and the listeners? So uh, I have several projects uh, in the works. One I would mention is a professional one. Um, it analyzes the dynamics of transatlantic alliance politics and NATO in the context of competition between the US and China, and specifically looks at the role of the Eastern Mediterranean and countries like Italy, Greece, and Turkey in that competition. The other project is fundamentally personal. Um, it's a novel about my grandfather's time as a partisan in Northern Italy during the Second World War. And it tells the story of ordinary Italians uh, fighting to overthrow fascism and struggling with the moral implications of resistance, revenge, and retribution that often happens in civil wars. Andrew, thanks for joining us and for this great discussion. Uh, we'll have it uploaded as well. Um, that wraps it up. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.